Hi everyone, it's Professor Primton, and in this video we're going to talk about polynomial functions and their graphs. So in this video we're going to talk about how to identify polynomials, how to recognize characteristics of the graph of a polynomial function, and also determine the end behavior for the graph of a polynomial function using its leading term. And then we're also going to use factoring to find the real zeros of a polynomial function. So in this section we're going to study polynomial functions where we have degree higher than 2. So we talked about degree 2 in the previous video, which were called quadratic functions. So now we're going to talk about degree that are larger than 2. So the following is a summary of all the terminology that we're going to encounter in this section that involves polynomial functions. So polynomial functions of degree n will be of this form, p of x is equal to a sub n x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus, and then you can have several terms that all lead down to a sub 1 times x plus a sub 0. So if it's a degree n polynomial function, then the highest power on the variable x will be n. And notice that the a sub n is just the number in front or the coefficient of that term. And you have a sub n minus 1, that is the next coefficient for the next highest power of x, which is n to the minus 1 power, and so on. You may have all the powers all the way down to x to the first power, which is a sub 1 is the coefficient, and a sub 0 is the coefficient for x to the 0 power. And so if n is the degree of the polynomial function, n must be a non-negative integer, and it cannot be 0. The a sub 0, a sub 1, a sub 2, all up to a sub n, those are called coefficients of the polynomial. a sub 0, the last term that has x to the 0 power, that's called the constant coefficient or the constant term. The a sub n is called the leading coefficient. And the a sub n, x to the n power, the entire first term is called the leading term of the polynomial function. And so the polynomial function can be written in descending order of the degrees. But whatever power that has the highest power of x, that's called the leading term. And then you have the next highest power of x all the way down to the lowest power of x. That's what's called descending order of degree. Now, just like the domain of a quadratic function was the set of all real numbers, the domain of a polynomial function is also the set of all real numbers. So no matter what value you input for the variable x, you will only have exactly one y value, and it will never be undefined. So the domain of a polynomial function is negative infinity to infinity. And now, for example, let's say we look at this polynomial expression. You have 3x to the 5th plus 6x to the 4th, subtract 2x cubed plus x squared plus 7x, subtract 6. The 3, the 6, the negative 2, the 1, 7, and negative 6, those are called coefficients of the polynomial function. Notice that the highest power of x is 5, so that's called the degree of the polynomial function. The 3x to the 5th is what's called the leading term because it contains the highest power or the degree of the polynomial function. The 3 is called the leading coefficient, the coefficient for the leading term. And then negative 6 is what's called the constant term because that's where you have x to the 0 power. The following table is going to list some examples of polynomial functions that we actually have seen already. And also, polynomial functions are also called just polynomials for short. And we're going to compare the degree, the leading term, and also the constant term. So let's say we have a polynomial p of x is equal to 4x minus 7. Notice that the highest power of x is 1, so that would be the degree of the polynomial function, 1. The leading term would be 4 times x, or just 4x and the constant term would be negative 7. These types of functions we've seen earlier. This is called a linear function because the highest power of x was 1, and so a linear function is a special type of polynomial function where the degree is 1. Let's say we look at the polynomial function p of x is equal to x squared plus x. The highest power on the variable x is 2, and so the degree is 2. The leading term is x squared, and the constant term, notice you don't have an, a term where you have x to the 0 power, so the constant term is just 0. And then this type of polynomial function is, has degree 2. It's called a quadratic function. And so quadratic functions are also polynomial functions where you have degree 2. So let's look at p of x equals 2x cubed subtract 6x squared plus 10. Notice the highest power of x is 3. So this is degree 3 polynomial function. The leading term is 2x cubed. And the constant term is 10. And so this is what's called a polynomial function where you have degree 3 is a cubic function. P of x equals negative 5x to the 4th plus x minus 2. The highest power of x is 4, so the degree of this polynomial function is 4. Negative 5x to the 4th is the leading term, and negative 2 is the constant term. Notice you don't actually have to have every single power of x for a polynomial function. You have the highest power will always be called the leading term, and the highest power that's on the variable is called the degree. But notice you don't actually have to have x cubed, x squared, and so on. Those are 0x cubed and 0x squared in this polynomial function. And so if you have a degree 4 polynomial function, this is what's called a quartic polynomial. So now that we know what polynomial functions will actually look like, and how to determine the degree and also the leading term and constant term for a polynomial function, let's talk about what the graph of a polynomial function will look like. So here's an example of a polynomial function's graph. Notice you can draw the graph without lifting your pencil or pen. 
and also there's no sharp corners and no cusp in the graph so the graph is smooth and so this graph would represent a polynomial function on the other hand this graph that's on the right notice that you cannot draw the graph with one continuous motion because you would have to lift your pencil with this gap that's in the graph and then continue the graph you also have a hole in the graph as well which means you have to lift your pencil or pen to continue drawing the graph notice that you also have what's called a cusp so this is where the graph will jut in really quickly and jut out and then you also have what's called a corner if you have any sharp corners or cusp the graph is not smooth so this function is not smooth and it's not continuous so it cannot be a, a graph of a polynomial function so let's talk about graphing polynomial functions next the graph of a polynomial function of degree 0 or degree 1 we've talked about previously, those are graphs of lines. And we've also talked about in the previous section that graphs of polynomial functions of degree 2, those are called quadratic functions. Their graphs are parabolas, so those are U-shaped graphs. The greater the degree is for a polynomial function, the more complicated its graph will become. And so the first thing that we're going to talk about is, for a polynomial function's graph, what is its shape, which is called the end behavior. Will the graph continue going up? or down on the right end or the left end of the graph. And this is what's happening at the ends of the graph. The end behavior of a polynomial function is a description of what happens whenever x becomes very large or whenever x becomes very negative. And so this is what's called arrow notation. If x is getting very large without bound, you use x and then a right arrow infinity. This means that as x approaches infinity or as x goes to infinity, the x values increase without bound. And if x right arrow negative infinity, this means x goes to negative infinity or x approaches negative infinity. That means x decreases without bound. The x values will continue to get more and more negative. And so this is just a shorthand way of writing out what happens whenever x gets really large or whenever x gets very, very negative. And so now we have a theorem that actually can help us find out what is the end behavior for a polynomial function's graph. So for large values of x, either positive or negative, so that means x approaches infinity or x approaches negative infinity, the graph of a polynomial function, so f of x equals a sub n x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 a sub 1 x plus a sub 0, so a polynomial function of degree n, it resembles the graph of a power function, which is of the form y equals a sub n x to the n. Notice that y equals a sub n x to the n, that is the leading term of our polynomial function. So in other words, the graph of a polynomial function is always determined by the graph or the behavior of the power function a sub n x to the n, which is its leading term in the polynomial function. So the following four graphs are going to show the four possible types of the n behavior of a polynomial function based on the highest power and also the sign of the leading coefficient. So our first case, let's say you have the highest power on the polynomial function is an odd number. So the degree is odd and the leading coefficient is a positive number. If x is approaching infinity, notice that the y values are also going towards infinity. If you're going to the far right end of your graph, the y values will increase without bounds. So the graph will continue going up as you go to the right. And if your graph is going to the left forever, notice that the y values are also decreasing without bound. So if x goes to negative infinity, that means your graph is going to the left forever, then the y values will also go towards negative infinity. And so this is what the shape of the graph for a polynomial function will look like if it has odd degree and positive leading coefficients. Notice that the behavior on the ends of the graph, the left end and the right end, they're opposites. One's going up as you're going to the right and the other one's going down as you go to the left. On the other hand, let's say you have an odd degree, so the degree is an odd number for a polynomial function, but this time you have a negative leading coefficient. If x is approaching negative infinity, the y values increase without bound, so y approaches in positive infinity, and if x is approaching positive infinity, the y values are decreasing without bound, so y approaches negative infinity. And so this, again, if you have an odd degree, you have opposite behavior on the ends of the graph. On the left end of the graph, the graph is increasing without bound. And if on the right end of the graph, the graph is decreasing without bound. Now let's say you have a polynomial function where you have an even degree. So the highest power is an even number. So if you have an even degree and a positive leading coefficient, the graph will go up on the far left end and also go up on the far right end of the graph. So if x approaches negative infinity, so that would be on the far left end of the graph, the y values increase without bound. That would be y approaches positive infinity. And if x approaches positive infinity, the far right end of the graph, the y values also increase without bound. So y approaches infinity. So notice that if you have an even degree polynomial function, you have the same behavior on the left end and the right end. It's going up on the left end, but it's also going up on the right end of the polynomial function graph.
In the last case for a polynomial function graph, let's say you have an even degree, but this time you have a negative leading coefficient. And so if x approaches negative infinity, so the far left end of the graph, the polynomial function will decrease without bound, so the y values approach negative infinity. And on the far right end of the graph, notice that the graph also decreases without bound. So if x approaches infinity, the y values also approach negative infinity. So the graph decreases without bound on both the left end and the right end of the graph. For a polynomial function, where you have even degree and also negative leading coefficient. And so notice if you have an odd degree polynomial function, they have opposite behavior on the ends of the graph. But if you have an even degree polynomial function, the ends of the graph have the same behavior, up on either end or down and down. So let's take a look at example one, end behavior of a polynomial function. Determine the end behavior for each of the following polynomial functions. So number one, the function is f of x equals negative 2x to the fourth plus 5x cubed plus 4x subtract 7. The end behavior of this polynomial function is determined by its leading term. So its leading term is negative 2x to the fourth. The degree of the polynomial function is 4, that's the highest power of x that appears, and the leading coefficient for this polynomial function is negative 2. And so the leading coefficient is negative, and the degree of the polynomial function is an even number, it's 4. And so the graph will fall to the left and also fall to the right. So on the far left end, the graph will decrease without bound, and on the far right end, the graph will decrease without bound. So how can you write this using arrow notation to explain that? If x is approaching as positive infinity, that would be the far right end of the graph, the y values, f of x, decreases without bound. So f of x approaches negative infinity. On the far left end of the graph, as x approaches negative infinity, also notice that the graph falls to the left. So that would be the y values, f of x, approaches negative infinity. Okay, number two. Let's say we have a polynomial function g of x is equal to 3x squared, subtract 5x to the fifth, plus 2x to the seventh. Notice that this polynomial function is not written in descending order. The highest power of x appears as the last term. So 2x to the 7th, that's the leading term for this polynomial function, even though it's written last. So the degree of the polynomial function is 7, so it's an odd number this time. And the leading coefficient of the polynomial function is 2, which is positive 2. And so it has odd degree, so the ends of the graph will have opposite behavior. And since the leading coefficient is positive, the graph will fall to the left, and the graph will also rise to the right. So if you're falling to the left, that would be x approaches negative infinity, the y values, g of x, also decrease without bound, so g of x approaches negative infinity. On the far right end of the graph, the graph rises. So if x approaches positive infinity, the y values increase without bound, so g of x also approaches positive infinity. So these are just two cases of the four that we talked about previously. If you have even degree, the graph will have the same end behavior on both the left end and the right end. So in this first problem, we had falling to the left and falling to the right. The graph decreased without bound on both ends of the graph. And if you have an odd degree, you have opposite behavior on the ends of the graph. In this case, if the leading coefficient is a positive number, the graph was falling to the left and rising to the right. So now that we've talked about the end behavior for a polynomial function graph, let's actually start filling in some of the details that happens in the middle of the graph. And so we're going to start by talking about the real zeros of a polynomial function. So using the real zeros to graph a polynomial function will correspond to x-intercepts. Where does the graph either cross the x-axis or touch the x-axis and turn around? Let's say you have a polynomial function, capital P of x. The number x equals c is called a zero if you substitute x equals c into your polynomial function and you get the y value of zero. In other words, it means that the zeros of a polynomial function are the solutions to an equation that involves a polynomial function, p of x equals zero. So if you take your polynomial function and set it equal to zero, then you're trying to find all the solutions to the polynomial equation, while the solutions are called zeros of a polynomial function. So we have the following theorem that actually tells us these four statements are all equivalent that involves real zeros of a polynomial function. So let's say you have a polynomial function, capital P of x, the number x equals c is a real number, then the following statements are equivalent. Number one, x equals c is a zero of p of x. Well, that means that if you substitute x equals c into your polynomial function, you'll get zero. So that means x equals c is a solution to the equation that involves the polynomial function, p of x equals zero. x minus c is a factor of p of x. So one of the biggest things that we're gonna talk about with polynomial functions is that if we can find out how the polynomial function factors, then we can actually find out the zeros of the polynomial function. And so if x equals c is a zero, that also means the same thing as x attract c is a factor of that polynomial function. If x equals c is a zero of a polynomial function, it also means that x equals c is an x-intercept on the graph of the polynomial function p of x.
And so if we want to find the zeros of a polynomial function, we're going to find out. If we can factor the polynomial function p of x, then we can use what's called the zero product property and then state each of the factors must be equal to zero and then we'll actually find out the zeros of a polynomial function that way because each of these four statements are equivalent. So since factoring polynomial functions are extremely important, let's do an example. We're going to find out what are the zeros of this polynomial function p of x equals x squared plus x to track 6. We're going to factor this polynomial function so that we can set it equal to zero and then find out what are the zeros of the polynomial function so that we can get p of x is equal to x squared plus x minus 6 is equal to, notice it's a trinomial because you have three terms, you want to find two numbers that multiply to negative 6 and the same two numbers need to add to positive 1. Well the two factors that work are positive 3 and negative 2. So one of the factors will be x to track 2 and the other factor of this polynomial function will be x plus 3. Well we know that a polynomial function will have zeros whenever the y value is equal to 0. Let's take the polynomial function x squared plus x to track 6, let's set it equal to 0. Well, we've already factored this polynomial function, so it's factors as x minus 2 times x plus 3, that's the left side of the polynomial equation, and the right side is still 0. So that means if you have two things multiplied together, two factors multiplied together, and you get an answer of 0, then one of the factors must be 0. x to track 2 is equal to 0, or the other factor, x plus 3, is equal to 0. And so if you solve these two resulting linear equations for x, then you find out that x equals 2, or x equals negative 3. These are called zeros of the polynomial function. And so from the previous statement, if you have real zeros of a polynomial function, they also correspond to x-intercepts on the graph of the polynomial function. And so we'll have an x-intercept at 2 comma 0 and also an x-intercept at negative 3 comma 0. All right, let's try example 2. Example 2 says real zeros of a polynomial function. Consider the polynomial function p of x is equal to 3x to the fourth subtract 6x cubed, subtract 11x squared plus 4x plus 6, and it tells us how it factors. The polynomial function will factor as x plus 1, that's one of the factors, times another factor, x subtract 3, times the another factor, 3x squared subtract 2. And each of the factors are in parentheses. What are the real zeros of this function? Well, the polynomial function, let's take it and set it equal to 0 so that we can find out the real zeros of the polynomial function. So p of x is equal to, let's use its factored form, x plus 1 times x minus 3 times 3x minus 2, the product of each of these factors is equal to 0 because we're going to find out the real zeros of this polynomial function. And so if you are multiplying three different factors together and the answer is 0, then one of the factors must be 0. So that means x plus 1 equals 0, or x minus 3 equals 0, or the last factor, 3x squared subtract 2, is equal to 0. And so if you solve each of these resulting equations, you'll have x equals negative 1 because x plus 1 equals 0, x equals 3 because x minus 3 equals 0. And then the last equation, notice that you have to solve this quadratic equation. Add 2 to the right side of the equation, so you have 3x squared equals 2, and then divide both sides by 3 first before you take the square root on both sides. And so you'll have x squared equals 2 thirds after you divide both sides by 3. And now if you want to undo the square on the variable x, you need to take the square root on both sides of the equation. But remember, if you take the square root to cancel out or undo the square on the variable, then you must include plus or minus in terms of the solutions of the equation. And so x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 2 thirds. And so there are four different solutions for this polynomial equation. You have x equals negative 1, x equals 3, x equals positive square root 2 thirds, and x equals negative square root 2 thirds. And so these are called real zeros of the polynomial function p of x, which was the polynomial 3x to the fourth, subtract 6x cubed, subtract 11x squared plus 4x plus 6. If you substitute these values into the polynomial function, the y value will be 0. All right, example 3. Let's construct a polynomial function this time. This time they're actually telling us what the real zeros are, and we're actually going to find out what is the polynomial function that actually has that information, that actually has the real zeros and also passes through a point. So find the polynomial function of degree 3, so the highest power of x will be 3, where the polynomial function has real zeros, negative 3, 2 and 5, and also the graph of the function must pass through the y-intercept of 0, 30 on its graph. So let's start off with the real zeros. If the real zeros are negative 3, 2, and 5, let's actually find out what are the factors of the polynomial function, because we know that the factors will actually help us construct the polynomial function. So if x equals negative 3 is a solution, or negative 3 is a real zero, that means x plus 3 must have been a factor for that polynomial function. So if x equals negative 3, x plus 3 is a factor. If x equals 2 is a solution to the polynomial equation, then x minus 2 is a factor, 
And for the same reason, if x equals 5 is a real zero, then x subtract 5 is a factor for the polynomial function. And so our polynomial function will look like this. Capital P of x for the polynomial function is equal to x plus 3 is one of the factors, times x subtract 2, and x subtract 5 is the other factor. If you multiply these three factors together, notice that the highest power of x will be 3. You will have x times x will give you x squared, and if you take that x squared times another x factor, you'll get x cubed. And notice that the degree of this polynomial function is 3. So we don't have any other higher powers on the factors. Each of the factors is raised to the first power. x plus 3 is to the first power, x minus 2 to the first power, and x minus 5 to the first power. However, we haven't actually used the information about the y-intercept is 0, 30. So the graph must pass through the point 0, 30. We'll notice that you could have had a greatest common factor that could have been in common with all the terms of your polynomial function. So let's find out, is there a number that can be factored out from all the polynomial function first? And so if you plug in x equals 0 for all your x values, the y value must be 30 for this polynomial function. So the y value can be 30 whenever the x values can be replaced with a 0. So you'll have a, some number, times 0 plus 3, times 0 subtract 2, times 0 minus 5. Well, on the right side of the equation, you have 3 times negative 2, times negative 5, times a, and it all equals 30. And so if you simplify the right side of the equation, you'll find out that's 30 times a, and the right side of the equation is 30. And so if you solve this equation for a, you'll find out that a is equal to 1. And so our polynomial function that actually will be degree 3 and also pass through this point, 0, 30, with real zeros negative 3, 2, and 5 must be this. P of x equals x plus 3 times the quantity x minus 2 times the quantity x minus 5. And if you multiply this out, you'll actually find out what is the polynomial function before it was factored. And so x plus 3 times x minus 2, if you use the FOIL method to multiply that out, you'll have x squared plus x subtract 6. Now take this answer x squared plus x minus 6, and multiply by the last factor, x subtract 5. And if you do that, you'll have x cubed, subtract 4x squared, subtract 11x plus 30. This polynomial function will pass through 0, 30. You'll have x-intercepts at negative 3, 2, and 5, and it will also be a degree 3 polynomial function, because the highest power on the variable is 3. So let's finish up this video by talking about one important theorem that actually can help us find out where are the real zeros of a polynomial function from this graph. So the following theorem has many different consequences, but we're going to use it in pre-calculus to actually help us graph a polynomial function. So this theorem is called the Intermediate Value Theorem. It says if P of X is a polynomial function, and P of A and P of B are opposite signs, so one's positive and the other is negative, then there exists at least an X value, X equals C, somewhere between X equals A and X equals B, where if you plug in X equals C into your polynomial function, it will be a Y value of zero. So let's see why the intermediate value theorem actually works and what it's actually saying. Let's say you have this graph of a polynomial function p of x. You have x equals a and you have x equals b. If you substitute an x equals a into your polynomial function, notice that the y value in this case will be a negative value. So p of a is negative, it's less than zero, so that means that the point a comma p of a is below the x-axis. And on the other hand, at x equals b, you get the opposite sign for the y value. So if you substitute b into your polynomial function for the x values, the y value p of b is greater than zero, which means in terms of the graph that the point b comma p of b is above the x-axis. And remember that the domain of a polynomial function is a set of all real numbers, or the domain is negative infinity to infinity. There are no gaps in your graph, and there are no jumps. So the graph of a polynomial function is continuous. Well, the intermediate value theorem says if p of a and p of b are opposite signs, so in this case p of a is negative and p of b is positive, then there must be at least one x value between x equals a and x equals b. It's labeled as x equals c. That is an x-intercept for this function's graph. So notice in this case, if you're below the x-axis at x equals a and you're above the x-axis at x equals b, then somewhere between x equals a and x equals b, if the function is continuous, then you must pass the x-axis at least one time. So let's finish up this video by talking about example four. We're going to use the intermediate value theorem to actually understand what does that actually help us in terms of finding the x-intercepts or the real zeros of a polynomial function. So use the intermediate value theorem to show that the polynomial function p of x equals x to the fourth plus x cubed subtract 9x squared subtract 3x plus 18 has at least one real zero on the closed interval, negative two less than or equal to x, less than or equal to negative one. So our polynomial function, x to the fourth plus x cubed minus 9x squared minus 3x plus 18, it's not been factored for us at all. But since we know it's a polynomial function, its graph must be continuous. 
and also must be smooth. So let's see what happens at the endpoints of our closed interval. So if x equals negative 2, p of negative 2 would be negative 2 to the fourth in parentheses plus negative 2 cubed minus 9 times negative 2 squared minus 3 times negative 2 plus 18. If you simplify this y value, the y value is negative 4, which means if the y value is negative, then you're below the x-axis. So at x equals negative 2, the graph is below the x-axis because the y value is negative. On the other hand, let's check the other endpoint, which is x equals negative 1. If you substitute negative 1 into your polynomial function, you'll have negative 1 in parentheses to the fourth plus negative 1 in parentheses cubed minus 9 times negative 1 squared, subtract 3 times negative 1 plus 18. If you simplify this y value, you'll come up with positive 14. And so at x equals negative 1, if the y value is positive, you're above the x-axis at x equals negative 1. And so what that means is that we actually can use the intermediate value theorem. We have a polynomial function, and the y values at our endpoints, x equals negative 2 and x equals negative 1, are opposite signs. One's in positive and the other one's negative. So by the intermediate value theorem, there must be at least one value, x equals c, somewhere between x equals negative 2 and x equals negative 1, where the y value must be 0. So since p of negative 2 is negative 4, it's less than 0. p of negative 1 is positive 14, it's greater than 0 then there is at least an x equals c somewhere between x equals negative 2 and x equals negative 1, where if you plug in x equals c into your polynomial function, you get 0. So that means you have a real 0 at x equals c by the intermediate value theorem. So this is a good place to stop our video. Now we talked about how to identify polynomial functions and also to recognize the characteristics of a graph of polynomial function, where the graph of polynomial function is both continuous and smooth. We've also talked about determining the end behavior for a polynomial function based on its leading term and also actually how to find the real zeros of a polynomial function. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about graphing polynomial functions.